Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Leslie Foster and I want to thank you for joining the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition for this webinar that we call Black and Rare Thyroid Eye Disease. I'm really delighted to be able to help usher us through a really important conversation about eye health and the symptoms that you should not ignore. We've got a lot to get to and some incredible panelists who will be sharing their words of wisdom, their knowledge, all for you to learn from today. But first, I wanna to begin today's program with a welcome from Kenita Seely. She is the Policy Council for the Black Women's Health Imperative, which of course is the organization spearheading the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. So Kenita, over to you. Hello, thank you, Leslie. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kenita Seely, Policy Council for the Black Women's Health Imperative. On behalf of the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar event, Black and Rare Thyroid Eye Disease. This webinar is being planned today in collaboration with the Graves and Thyroid Eye Disease Foundation and thanks to the sponsorship of Horizon Therapeutics. The Rare Disease Diversity Coalition was formed to address the challenges that marginalized populations face when seeking diagnosis and accessing treatment for rare diseases. Spearheaded by the Black Women's Health Imperative and comprised of a group of healthcare nonprofits, patient advocacy groups, and industry experts, the RDDC aims to educate and empower rare disease patients of color, reduce the time between the onset of symptoms and diagnosis, and eliminate racial bias. Today, our panel of clinical experts, providers, advocates, and rare disease patients will address important issues regarding thyroid eye disease, including incidence rates in communities of color, the link between Graves disease and thyroid eye disease, and strategies that can be used to raise awareness among our stakeholders. Thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. So much, Kanita. We've got the pleasure this afternoon of hearing from three-time Olympic gold medalist, Gail Devers. She's been living with Graves disease and thyroid eye disease symptoms of it for more than 30 years. But before we jump into our conversation, I wanna share this video that has a little bit of Gail's story. Every doctor I saw told me nothing was wrong. As an athlete, I know my body and I knew something wasn't right. It's 1988. I'm an American record holder in the 100 meter hurdles and I'm headed to my first Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea. But something was off. Suddenly I was running slower than I ever had and I didn't make the finals. I had dropped from 120 pounds to 80 pounds before I stopped looking at the scale. I was tired all the time and yet I wasn't getting any sleep. I had trouble with my eyes too. They hurt. They were bulging, irritated, and dry and I couldn't close my eyes fully when I slept. Meanwhile, my training had come to a stop. I covered up all my mirrors and I, I just wanted to black out the world. I felt like I'd lost myself. Well, that was certainly a powerful introduction to the conversation that we're going to have with Gail Devers to hear her say that she kept hearing doctors say nothing was wrong and how she knows her body. We're going to get into a bit of that because that's an important message for all of us. So you know by now that this five-time Olympian and three-time were a three-time Olympic gold medalist and nine-time world champion was one of the fastest women alive for almost two decades. And as she's going on this journey, she's diagnosed with Graves' disease and she's having symptoms of thyroid eye disease, which we know as TED for more than 30 years. So after two and a half years of struggling and trying to get answers, she finally received that Graves' disease diagnosis back in 1990. It was two years before winning her first Olympic gold medal. But you heard Gail talk about the saga and what she was feeling and what she was going through and trying to get doctors to listen to her. She finally got the critical answers she needed and she went on in a decorated 25 year career that followed, recognized as an American sporting icon. She won back to back 100 meter Olympic gold medals 
three world championships in the 100 meter hurdles, and she cemented herself as one of the most dominant female sprinters of all time. She has since been inducted into both the National Track and Field and the United States Olympic Halls of Fame. But these days, she is voluntold by her children to show up and do the very many things that she does as a coach on the sidelines, whether it's track and field or watching her daughter play flag football. She is just an amazing human, both in her athletic career and how she is trying to advocate for young athletes and for all of us to really tap into our eye health. So I'd love to welcome Gail Devers to the screen and talk a bit more about her journey. We're all super excited to have you here, Gail, not just because of your accomplishments, but because of your advocacy, because you have been so dedicated to trying to ensure that others don't have the same struggle that you have had. So let's dig right in because we hear in the video about these changes that are happening with your body. You know your body as right. a world-class athlete. You know that something is wrong. You're telling the doctors that something is wrong, but they're not listening even to you. Right. So tell us a bit more about how you got to this diagnosis. Because I think there are people who may be listening today who may be wondering, okay, well, let me talk, let me think about what this means for me too. Right. You know, I always say, like you, like you said before, I always, I wanted to tell people I know my body and I know my body probably better than the doctor that I'm going to see once or twice a year. So I just need somebody to listen. And it felt like no one was listening. I mean, I went from and I'm very like regimen as far as I have sticky notes. I write down my goals, how long it's going to take, you know. And so they were realistic goals that I had set for myself. And then to go into the doctor and say, OK, well, I'm losing weight or my hair is falling out or cert certain things that were happening. And they're like, well, maybe you train too hard or, you know, maybe you peak too many times or maybe what you're feeling is not what you're feeling. I'm like, mm. and. I, I think you st if, if you go to the medical profession and they're telling you this, eventually you might start to believe that, okay, well, maybe it's, maybe that is true. Maybe I am making all this up. But for me, I had to look at, you know, if I'm making it up in my head, I'm not making up the way I look. I got to the point where I covered all my mirrors because I couldn't stand the way I looked. My eyes were mm -hmm. bulging. You know, when I went to sleep, you know, people are like, oh, my gosh, your eyes don't close. You know, my eyes were, were always, you know, I had the artificial tears. I had everything known to mankind and it still was not working. I was losing weight at my worst. I was under like 80 pounds, like 79 pounds. There's a problem, you yeah. know, and and yet the people that I would lean on to go to to say, help me fix this so I can still have my career are telling me that, no, I don't think there's anything wrong. I think you just peaked too many times or what you thought was going on is not what's going on. But much in the way that you've approached your career, when you've seen a hurdle, you take <laughs> that sticky note, you figure out how you're going to get over it. You right. set a goal to get to an answer. It took you two and a half years to get that answer. Tell us a bit about what that was like and how you finally got to that diagnosis. You know, I was going from doctor to doctor because when one says there's nothing wrong, I go to someone else. And it got to the point where I was going through my provider book saying, hmm, this name sounds interesting. Let me go and see mm -hmm. if he or she knows what they're talking about. And um, like I said, this was a two and a half year quest. I just wanted to catch up to the old Gail. And from the goals that I had set, I knew something was wrong. And I was, you know, my trademark fingernails had broken. They wouldn't grow. Um, mm. Everything was just going wrong and awry. And so I just had to keep pursuing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And I remember this one particular day I had picked this name out of the book and I had an appointment. This was a Tuesday. I had an appointment on Thursday to see this doctor. And I happened to be at, at UCLA. I had stopped going out of the house because I got tired of people asking me questions. I didn't look the same if you had seen me, you know, a short time ago. And people would say, well, what's wrong? And I'd say, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as I know, they're telling me there's nothing wrong. You know, they're like, mm -hmm. well, have you gone to the doctor? Well, yeah. Well, what did they say? They said, there's nothing wrong. And so, you know, you start to feel like you're crazy. And mm -hmm. am I really making this up? Is, is, is it that I'm a washed up athlete and I'm just continuing trying to look for something? 
although in my heart of hearts, I didn't believe that was the case. And so for whatever reason, I had to go up to UCLA on this particular day. And I passed by the a center where they, someone was giving a talk. Now, her, her, uh, we used to have doctors that were assigned to our team. She was giving a talk and she said, hey, hold on, hold on. And I'm like, oh gosh, here we go again. Somebody's going to ask me what's wrong. I'm not going to have an answer. I waited. Uh, we hugged. And instead of her saying, hey, what's going on? She takes out her stethoscope and she starts to examine me and tells me, I mm -hmm. think you have a very serious problem with your thyroid. First time I had ever heard of that. No one had ever said thyroid this or anything like that. And um, it was a relief, but I was scared because I'm like, I don't know. You got to come to the doctor with me. You know, she wrote down the TSH test tells, telling me that I need to get this done. And I kind of played back and forth of going to this doctor saying, I'm just going to let him go ahead and do all his little examination and then tell me, I'm sorry, Ms. Devers, there's nothing wrong. I'm going to whip out my paper and say, hey, I need this test. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't wait. I sat there. He came in and I gave him the paper and I said, I need to have this. He said, I don't need your little paper. I can tell you a walking thyroid disorder. And then the tears just started flowing mm -hmm. because this had been two and a half years of trying to just find an answer for somebody tell me, no, Gail, you're not crazy. All the things that you're feeling, there truly is something wrong with you so that I could just catch back up to Gail. And it, it was, it was scary because I didn't know what it was, what I was going to have to go through. You know, the name alone, I keep saying, we got to figure out how to change the name of Graves disease because you already feel like you have one foot in the grave and to mm -hmm. be told that you have something like this. And, but it was, it was a life changing moment for me. This had an impact on your career in some ways, but eventually you were able to take this information, to take this knowledge, the diagnosis and the treatment and push through it to continue on your, your life's path. And I think there's a message there, right? That you got to keep going. You, you got to keep going, whether it's pushing for answers or continuing toward the path that you believe is is your purpose I, I i believe it like i said i set goals for myself and it was two and a half years i still had to take those notes down wipe them off they were a little dusty but i had to get back to it like i said i just wanted to catch up to gail and once i caught her i wanted to pass her and what i had written down years before was to be able to go to the olympic games and it's not about coming across the finish line first it's about being a winner by your efforts you know and so for me getting across that finish line with my efforts of saying what I want to do and what I'm going to do. And I tell people, you have to push, you have to be an advocate for your health. You have to be able to tell somebody, Hey, I'm not going to accept the word. No, help me find me, you know, and I, I was still ex experiencing symptoms, you know, the weight loss, um, even after being diagnosed, I started, you know, I was still having issues with my eyes. They were still bulging. They were dry. They were gritty. Sometimes they were watery. They still didn't close. Um, to this day, I start, I was having issues as I was driving, like where mm -hmm. the oncoming cars, like the lights were bothering me. And I myself said, okay, you know what? I've got my life. You know, I fought to get my life back. I got it back. These are residuals. I just have to deal with it. And didn't know 30 years later, I was going to be dealing with something else. You know, I want to talk the, about this a little bit because you shared something that you were having trouble with this night driving but you didn't even say anything to your family, your husband about it. You were really concerned about the stigma. And I can certainly understand as a world-class athlete, this, this idea that you're superwoman mm -hmm. and maybe you were concerned about how your family would perceive you. I'm sure there may be other people who have that same concern. They may be having the same symptoms that you've talked about, but they don't want to share. I, I want to talk about the courage that it takes to do that, though, and how you tap into that when everything you've been told is, you know, keep it to yourself or there's nothing wrong. What, what was the breakthrough point for you to eventually share this with your family so that they could be part of your team? Um, you know, it was, it was the same with my Graves disease in general that I didn't tell. I was going to the doctors, but when I didn't have answers and it's kind of like when you don't have answers, it's like, OK, well, Either are you not being tough? Do you have to figure out how, you know, how to persevere and get through this, even deep down in your heart when you know something's wrong? And it just got to the point where I said, you know what? I wasn't like this a short time before. 
And I had to do that soul check where I had to take the, the, the covers off the mirror and actually look myself in the eye and say, this was not Gail a couple months ago. There's something wrong. It doesn't change that quickly. Can you tell us, was this a sudden onset? Or as you go back, was it a slow sort of progression for you? That is to say, if folks are wondering if it's an allergy or a dry eye, what were some of the early symptoms that you had that were sort of red flags for you? Um, I think it's, it's a slow progression. But if you don't, like I always tell people now, get a little journal and write down everything you're feeling. So when you go into the doctor, you tell everything. You know, it's kind of like when you take your car in because you hear a knock. And as soon as you get there, that knock is gone. So you were like, okay, I forget about that part. I'm telling you about the, the part that I see. And so for me, it was, you know, the eyes, they were, I mean, I've always had large eyes, but they were bulging. They were constantly red. And one would be in it. You, you, we ourselves, I think, start to explain the symptoms away. Well, you know, I'm a little tired or, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't get as much sleep or, or this is why this is the, the way it is. And that may not be the case. You have to, anything that you're feeling, you have to say it. You know, I always tell people have a great relationship with a doctor. Find a doctor that not only are you going to this doctor and they're looking at you, ha, sit down. I mean, this is me. I don't go to a doctor if I don't sit down and we have a conversation for about five minutes. So, you know, if I plan an appointment, I got to talk to Gail. I don't just want you to look at me and say what looks different. Talk to me and ask me what's happened since the last time you've seen me. Then we have this good rapport and I know that you're going to help me. And that's kind of how how it was with me, with the eyes and everything. And it was like you said, it was embarrassing at first to be able to say that, you know, telling my husband, oh, we're driving cross country. I'll drive in the daytime. And I never said why, because I'm like, well, maybe mm. it's just me. Maybe it's, you know. I don't know, maybe something's going on and should I complain? I have my life, you know, it's it's 20 years past or 25 years past the time of my grave disease and I'm still having residual effects, but I'm alive. Let's just be happy with that. So I'll deal with that. But I'm like, you know what? Am I putting myself in danger? Am I putting other people in danger by not being able to really see and it's really bothering me? I've got to speak up. And it was it was that weight lifted off your shoulder to be able mm. to say and then and then to be able to to have a diagnosis to be able to know, you know, thyroid eye disease is like, what is that? I thought that these were, you know, the residual effects. And now to know that 50% of people who have Graves disease may develop this, I want to shout it and tell the world. I've got to tell people, pay attention to your eye health. If you're having any of these symptoms, the dry eyes, you know, the grittiness, the watery eyes, the redness, you need to go and see. And, and we assume that our Graves disease doctors can help us and that's why I never heard of it, because it's it's related, but it's separate and it has to be treated by someone separate, like an ocul, you know, uh, or a neuroplastic surgeon or ocul, uh, you know, somebody different. I'll just put it that way. Sure, sure. And so it was a relief to me. It was a blessing. And just to say that, you know, I'm I'm still getting my life back together and there's several chapters to Gail Deaver. So I'm just keeping turning those pages and, and looking for my best life. I was going to ask you about some of the chapters <laughs> in some of those pages in, in the book of Gail Deaver's. <laughs> how how are you managing the symptoms of graves and, and thyroid eye disease? Because it doesn't fully go away, right? This is no, it does not. You. I always tell people I always have eye drops. <laughs> um, for me, it, and it's it's a daily, you know, I do a lot of things and you, you have to be what is con considered camera ready. But with I, thyroid eye disease, sometimes you cannot be. You know, there's always with my Graves disease, I, you know, I have an appointment. I just set an appointment this morning to go and make sure that I, I'm, a, I'm on point with both of those, uh, you know. And so it's, it's, it's lifelong. Um, you learn to deal with it. Everybody has something that they have to go through. And I always tell people I look at life as one hurdle at a time. And if something doesn't feel right, I'm going to figure it out. If you say I can't go over it, then I'm going through it. And that means that I'm pushing towards that finish line. I want to keep that, that finish line in my view. Because if I stop pushing towards the finish line, then I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing myself a disservice. Everybody deserves, we have one life to live and everybody deserves the best quality of life that we can have. And that means 
pushing to get the answers. When you know something's wrong, don't accept no for an answer. I always tell people, I don't know what the word no is until I had kids. Now it's no, you can't go there. No, you can't have that. But <laughs> but it's, when it comes to my health, you can't tell me no. I need you to be a part of my team, just like when I ran. And I think that's the difference with me now, as you asking, what am I doing? When I ran, I had a team that helped me get to the finish line. And now I still have a team. I've got my Graves' disease doctor, you know, I've got my ophthalmologist, neuro-ophthalmologist that, and everybody's helping me do what I need to do to keep Gail Devers on track and moving forward. Does this run in your family at all? Is this something that you will be watching to, to for your own daughters, your own children to see if, if they develop as well? Oh, definitely. When they were born, you know, we made sure um, that, you know, tests were, were done. And, you know, back then, as my daughter, my youngest daughter, Legacy says, back in the day <laughs> when I was when I was running, <laughs> that shows you how old she thinks I am. Um, you know, it's you tell um, her you're forever young. I, I, can you explain that? I tell people I'm forever 21 and they even open up a store with my name. So uh, <laughs> it's um, it's just making sure, you know, no one in my family, when I was first diagnosed with my Graves' disease, no one had it. Mm -hmm. But as I, you know, I always tell people it does not discriminate age, sex, none of that. And so what I found out as I've gotten older and gotten more information about this is that um, autoimmune disorders, so no one has Graves' disease in my family but me. But my mom has lupus. My youngest daughter, Legacy, has Kawasaki's disease. I've got insulin-dependent people like my aunts. Um, so that tends to run in families, which mm -hmm. makes me more susceptible to getting this. But yes, we've made sure that, you know, we were we were checking for Graves disease and then Kawasaki's came up with my with my youngest daughter. But we manage. You know, I would say everybody has a story. Everybody mm -hmm. has a journey that they've got to go through. And we've got to just keep pushing, keep pushing through to get to the other side. What would you say to someone who is newly diagnosed with thyroid eye disease and assembling their team? Right. Mm -hmm. So they can come out on the winning side of this. Right. What, what would be your advice to them? Make sure that that team that you're assembling, that you're uh, comfortable with them, that they're listening to you. Like I always tell people, listen to your eyes, listen to your health. Also, make sure your team is doing the same thing. It is, you know, no one gets anywhere by themselves. Everybody wants to be successful. What does success mean? It doesn't mean you have to win the, the race. It doesn't mean you have to own the company or make the most money. It means you have to be the best you that you can be. And in life, that quality of life we all deserve and the effort that you give and everyone that's a part of your team has to give that 100% and a little umph, which takes you across the finish line. Last question would be for, for folks who are having a bad day, right? <laughs> There's something about the mindset of a champion to keep pushing through, to keep grinding through, to not give up. And I wonder for you, if you think that mindset actually helped in dealing with this, right? Because for some people, these kind of diagnoses, rare as they are, can really be debilitating, right? right. right. No. So how do you develop a championship mindset when you're tackling something like this? And as you mentioned, you may feel different from day to day to day. Right. Let's talk about the tenacity and the endurance that you need for a race that doesn't end. <laughs> You're right. This is a race for your life. And it's about, you know, we all have days where we may feel like the walls are closing in on us and there's no way out. And what do you do? Your life is worth it. So sometimes you have to reach deep. Sometimes you have to reach deeper. Sometimes you have to reach down to your toes to find that strength and that inspiration to keep going. That's why that team that's around you on those days where it seems dark can help to be that light. You know, for me, I always tell people that I have this guardian angel that rests on my shoulder. And as long as I live my life right, I know things are going to work out OK. If I had my whole life to live over. I would mm -hmm. ask for my Graves disease. I would ask for my thyroid eye disease. And people are like, why? because it's made me who I am. Mm. It's made me stronger than I ever thought I could be. 
it made me know that I could get through things when when I thought that the chips were down and I can't go any further. You know, if someone were to tell me that all my dreams would come true if I just get across the room, you fill the room up with water or the, or the room goes dark and I can't see at all, I'm going to keep clawing to get to that other side. Or for me, I look at it as a finish line. No matter how many hurdles or rocks or whatever you throw in my, in my way, I'm gonna figure out how to keep going. And that's the attitude that we have to have. And sometimes you gotta lean on somebody and they gotta help you across. But as long as you keep moving forward, any progress is, is, is movement in the right direction. Any parting words from Gail Devers to the rest <laughs> of us? You know, just just pay attention to your health. The earlier, the better. You know, don't be like me. I, I'm supposed to be a sprinter and get across the finish line quickly. But I took that long route and my, you know, thyroid eye disease didn't come. My diagnosis didn't come for 30 years. So it's about the sooner, the better. And that's what it's about. Well, Gail Devers, you have sprinted your way into history and into our hearts, not just for what you've been able to accomplish, but by what you give to everybody by having these really courageous conversations about what's happening with your body, giving people permission to listen to their own bodies and seek out help. And of course, your pearls of wisdom about assembling that team, keeping those sticky notes handy and the journal to make sure that you write down everything so that when you do finally get to that doctor who listens to you, you'll be able to help them join your team and be successful. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, for your heart this afternoon, and we wish you continued success as you keep on barreling through this race of a lifetime. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Wonderful to have you. Wonderful to have you. Well, you've heard from the champion but now you're going to hear from some other extraordinary people who are going to be joining us to continue this conversation. They too are connected to thyroid, eye disease, and grave disease and have their own stories to share. So allow me to introduce our next panelists. Kimberly Doris is the executive director and the CEO of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. It's a small nonprofit. It's located in California. And Kimberly was diagnosed with Graves Disease in 2007. She started as a volunteer with this organization before she would eventually become the head of it. She holds her BA from the University of Arizona and her MBA from Belmont University. And before she came to this dynamic organization, she spent 10 years working at a community bank and eight years working for Mercury Nashville Records. Quite a story. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> Dr. Gary Lelly is an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Weill Cornell Medical College. He is actually the vice chair of ophthalmology, a board certified ophthalmologist who specializes in oculastic surgery. I hope I got that right, Dr. Lelly. That's a big Thank one. you. <laughs> Oculo, oculoplastics. You were very, Thank very close. You. We were so <laughs> close, so close there. Um, but during your training, you were accredited by the prestigious American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Let me just say, I am so glad that I don't have to say these words all the time. <laughs> These are not TV friendly words right here, but I want to tell everybody that you gained your broad clinical and surgical experience while treating patients at Columbia University Medical Center at the Manhattan Eye, Ear and Throat Hospital at New York University Hospital at Bellevue Medical Center and the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. You also spent time at the University of Michigan, my home state as well. You are an incredible ophthalmologist spending a lot of time working with the staff of the New York Rangers as their team ophthalmologists. So helping them see their way to championships as well. So Dr. Lelly, thank you for being here. And of course, we welcome to round out this dynamic panel, Laquilla Harris, who is a TED patient and advocate, lives here in the Maryland area, not far from where I am here in Washington. And Laquilla started to first 
experience issues with her health, like burning an itching eye and swollen eyelids back in 1998. She too saw countless doctors and has a story similar to Gail Deavers, where she had to finally get to a physician who recognized that something wasn't right and diagnosed her with Graves' disease in 2006. But because of that delay, she had already lost the vision in her left eye and she was really starting to lose her vision in her right eye. And even her eye specialist warned that there was a possibility that she might lose her vision permanently. Thankfully, that is not the case. In 2009, with help from the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, she was finally able to get access to the specialists who got her the answers that she needed. She suffered in silence for years, but in 2010, she began a journey to restore her sight and become an advocate for others with TED. So thank you all for joining us, for bringing your own different life experiences to this conversation and really helping to continue to educate people. So Kimberly, I'd really love to start with you. And I talked about how you were a volunteer for the Graves mm -hmm. Disease and Thyroid Foundation before you joined as the head of the organization. <laughs> people who are just learning about it, tell us what mm -hmm. the organization does and what it offers people who are taking this journey. Yeah, absolutely. So we were actually founded in uh, 1990 by a um, lady named uh, Dr. Nancy Horde Patterson. Uh, she got diagnosed with Graves disease um, and later thyroid eye disease and just found herself really frustrated by the inability to find resources. So um, you can imagine what this was like back in the late 80s, early 90s before the internet. Um, you know, you could, you know, had information accessible at the, the touch of a button. And so she literally founded this group out of her living room um, you know, at one point she had, she was so excited to get a, um, an article about Graves disease in Reader's Digest magazine. Um, and they said, are you prepared for the response? And she said, yeah, I, I think so. And, uh, next thing she knew she had 3000 pieces of mail in her living room. So, um, yeah, so a, a lot's changed, um, in the last, uh, 30 years. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the story that we heard from Gail is still all too common and a lot of people struggle um, going from doctor to doctor to doctor to get a diagnosis. So we provide, um, we're a patient group, we won't give medical advice, but we provide um, information and support to help patients uh, get started and, and continue with this journey. You talked about how it's really a journey to get information and answers. And, and Dr. Lelly, I wonder why is that? Why is it so hard for patients to get physicians to listen to them when they're saying something is not right. What's happening? Right. I mean, Leslie, first off, the, the most important thing is we're here and we're we're educating as many people as we can about the disease. And it, it is a relatively rare disease. So you need to find the right specialists. Um, and we've mentioned it a couple of times uh, already, but the, the folks who treat thyroid eye disease are oculoplastic specialists or neuro-ophthalmologists. So they're subspecialty trained ophthalmologists. And really that's gonna be your key in terms of finding the right provider to, um, to give you the information that you need, to listen to you, and to help you understand what that diagnosis is and, and what the options are for each individual patient. Um, so I think that's key one. And, and, and as Kimberly mentioned, you know, we have the ability now with the web to get a lot of really useful information. And there is a website, uh, focusonted.com, that'll help patients find providers in their zip code. So you can actually go on there and find specialists if you think you may have these symptoms. But just as you said, it's, it's, it's really sad. We still see many patients who have to see multiple multiple doctors to get the correct diagnosis. They're diagnosed with things that are very common like dry eye or allergies, um, when in fact it's Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease that, that the patient has. So, so we still see this as a problem and that's why we're so passionate about educating um, everybody about, about this disease. I want to ask you another follow-up question while I have you here, because we hear people, we hear all, all of us are using the words TED and Graves' disease. What is the link between the two? Right. They're both autoimmune conditions, um, but they're separate. Graves' disease is an autoimmune condition that affects the thyroid gland, typically causing high thyroid levels or hyperthyroidism. So you get systemic symptoms from that disease, things like racing heart, as Gail 
described earlier, loss of weight. Um, you feel hot when it's when everyone around you is not hot. Um, those types of symptoms. Running sort of along a parallel track, but a separate disease process is, is TED or thyroid eye disease. And that disease is an autoimmune process that affects around the eyes and the structures behind the eyes, most notably the fat behind the eyes and the muscles behind the eyes. And that gives the telltale appearance of TED, which is that bulging appearance to the eyes or that sort of a startled appearance to the eyes from the inflammation that's occurring around the eyes. Really important for people to know that if you have Graves' disease or a thyroid problem, but in particular Graves' disease, up to half of patients with Graves' disease can develop thyroid eye disease. So if you have Graves, mm -hmm. automatically make sure you get yourself a, an ophthalmology checkup to just see if you have even the most subtle signs of the disease, or at least so we have a baseline on you in case you develop TED. It, Laquilla, you weren't having just subtle symptoms during the journey to get a diagnosis. You were having full-on symptoms and really struggling to get someone to listen to you. You have since turned that pain into purpose and advocacy. You know, these kinds of diseases can take, what, seven separate clinicians sometimes to get an answer from. You heard Dr. Lelly talk about how now you can put your zip code in and you can get a list of providers. That would have been tremendously helpful for you on your journey, right? Because this was not easy for you as well. You're absolutely right, Leslie. It actually, it took my fifth doctor who happened to be an endocrinologist to diagnose me in his examining room with Graves' disease, but he knew that I needed to see a specialist. So he made an appointment for me while I was in his office to see an ophthalmologist. Once I saw this particular ophthalmologist, he, I loved his honesty because he did confirm I had Graves' disease, but he told me, he said, I've never seen a patient who look quite like you. So he said, I need you to see a colleague of mine's and they rescheduled me for that. That's the seventh doctor. And he was the one to diagnose me with Graves and thyroid eye disease. But at the point that you got that diagnosis, you had already started to lose vision. I had already lost my left eye. So we were working, we were trying to actually save the right eye, but I ended up losing that right eye. Uh, for a total of uh, seven years, I was declared legally blind. Wow. Legally blind. Legally blind. And so where is your sight now? How How is your sight now? Today, it's a struggle still. Like Gail said, um, the eye drops, the constant eye drops, uh, the teary eyes, the, the sand. And when I still go to sleep, I... Uh, my eyes aren't fully closed. But see, what I like about everything, knowing things now, it can be treated, but there's no cure. And that's what people don't understand. So it's going to be a challenge for the rest of my life. It's a challenge that, Kimberly, you understand as well, because you were also diagnosed with Graves' disease. So you know both nice. on the side of being a patient and on the side of leading an advocacy organization about what that journey is like. I wonder for you, you know, what kind of team, we keep hearing that word team. Gail talked about team. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lelly talked about team. Laquilla talked about a team. What kind of team do you need to assemble to help you on this really long race? If you're sitting here and you're going, okay, who do I write down? What do I need to know? Let's talk about that. Um, so obviously, as Dr. Lelly mentioned, you need a, um, an eye specialist, oculoplastic surgeon, a neuro ophthalmologist. Um, this is not a condition that you just go to the um, eyeglass place in the mall and get treatment. You, you need a, a specialist to deal with this. Um, you want an endocrinologist that's very familiar with Graves' disease. Um, there are some endocrinologists that primarily see diabetes patients and they don't see a lot of Graves. So you want someone that's, that's very familiar with Graves' disease and the treatment options. And that's important because um, if you are hyperthyroid or even hypothyroid, um, the, there's a, an increased risk that you will have issues with TED. So, um, so that's very important. And one other thing I just kind of want to mention that's off topic, but I think that's important is 
your Graves disease and your thyroid eye disease will likely occur at the same time, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, you know, we hear from patients who their, you know, their Graves disease was treated 20 years ago, and you know, then they get eye symptoms and they're not even thinking about the Graves um, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, maybe they take their thyroid hormone replacement once a day, and that's it's it, no longer top of mind. And so the, the TED and the Graves disease most often appear together, um, but the TED can occur much, much later. Um, and in a, a few cases, you can actually have TED um, before you have thyroid dysfunction. So um, just kind of wanted to, to touch on that. But in terms of rounding out your team, um, you might need a dermatologist. Uh, there's a condition called pretibial myxedema that appears as a, a rash on the front of the shin. Um, that's it's red, but it, it, the texture is kind of like an orange peel. Um, so a, a dermatologist, if you have um, that. Um, but finally, I want to say, don't be afraid to add a mental health professional to your team. Uh, this disease is devastating. Um, there was actually some research done um, out of University of California, San Diego, uh, Shiley Eye Institute, and they found, um, and I'm, I'm going to read this quote um, mm -hmm. so I get it correct. Um, the researchers found levels of depression and anxiety that rival cancer and AIDS. Wow. Um, and what surprised the, that didn't surprise the researchers so much, but what did surprise them um, was that it wasn't just the double vision and the dryness and that um, that affected people the most, but it was not looking like yourself, you know, mm -hmm. exactly like what Gail said, you know, covering up the mirrors in, the, in her house and not wanting to look at herself. So, you know, that's it's absolutely can be devastating for people. And so um, do not hesitate to reach out and add a, a mental health professional to your team if you need that. I'd like to ask you also about treatment, Kimberly, because I know mm -hmm. there are some people who might not feel comfortable with all the medication that might be needed to help you treat or, or any kind of you know, medication that they may have to be on long term. Are there some natural, are there some alternative cures for TED? Because you know these things circulate. So let's just mm -hmm. put it to rest right now if that's not the yeah. case. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any um, so-called alternative, alternative treatment options that have been proven to be effective. Um, if there's, there's one issue, and maybe Dr. Lilly can follow up on this and touch on it, is there's some, been some buzz around selenium um, that perhaps for mild thyroid eye disease that might have an impact. But one of the concerns is that much of that research was done in areas that were known to be selenium deficient. So the question mm -hmm. is, you know, is, is the issue of getting people up to the normal selenium levels the issue or is there some other um, impact? So I, hopefully you can follow up with, uh, with Dr. Lilly after that. But um, I would just add in terms of supplements, um, you know, as I said, there is nothing that's been proven to be effective um, either for Graves disease or thyroid eye disease. Um, if you are taking supplements, uh, talk to your doctor and make sure your doctor knows everything you're taking and in what dose um, before you go off and try to do something on your own. Some supplements can interact with your medications um, and others can be um, problematic if they're taken in uh, too large of a dose. Dr. Lelly, do you have some thoughts about selenium as a, as a potential alternative treatment? <laughs> Sure, Kimberly, those are great points. Um, and and actually, before I get to selenium, I just wanted to um, to thank you for bringing up the psychosocial impact that this disease has on patients. I quote that study all the time. Um, and uh, you know, as physicians, we oftentimes uh, many of us make the mistake of of just thinking about the the functional implications of a disease. Okay, it's causing double vision. What are the measurements? Um, but it's really important to to find a physician who will also take the time to say, but how are you doing? Are you still going to your work? Are you avoiding social situations? Because you are correct. A, a mental health uh, assistance is 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 something that many patients with the TED um, will benefit from. So really great point. In terms of the selenium, everything you said, 100% accurate. It was a 2012 New England Journal of Medicine article that was published, but it was a study that was done in Europe, as you mentioned, low selenium um, 
regions and, and, and for patients in the United States, typically that's not the case. That being said, I do recommend it for my patients with TED. I talk to them about it um, because I think there's very li little risk to taking it. It's an antioxidant mm -hmm. um, and it's in many multivitamins to begin with. So yeah. um, I recommend it. Um, the other thing that's important to talk to patients about that, that we haven't brought up that we can call quote unquote, a natural remedy is not to smoke cigarettes. Um, mm -hmm. So smoking cigarettes increases the risk of developing TED by about eightfold if you're a patient with Graves' oh, disease. Wow. And it increases the risk of having a much longer progressive and active inflammatory phase of the disease and a more severe course of the disease. So at every appointment, if I have a patient who's a smoker, I ask them if they've stopped. If, if there's a, ever a time to stop smoking, it's when you've gotten this diagnosis. And I even go as far as to tell them to avoid secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. That's incredible. What do we know about the triggers that might cause either a slow or sudden onset of TED? So there's risk factors. So um, that's the, the big thing in terms of whether a patient will have a more severe form of the disease. Um, and the risk factors are um, typically men, older patients, smokers. Um, if they have systemic signs from their Graves disease, um, like the dermatologic signs that Kimberly was mentioning, those can be associated with a worse prognosis. And then the probably the most important one is what we call the acuity of onset of the disease. Basically, if you have a patient who shows up in the office and they say, gosh, you know, I had Graves. And then I took some photos recently. I noticed my eyes looked a little bit different. I have no idea when it happened. That came on very slowly and it was mm -hmm. kind of an insidious onset. If you have a patient that shows up in your office and they say six weeks ago, I was normal. And now my eyes are bulging out. I'm seeing double, they're red, they're painful. Uh, and I'm losing vision. That is a fast course. And that's a patient we're going to worry about. Um, so I think that's key in terms of um, kind of putting the patients into the correct bucket of, of mild, moderate, or severe, and then and then going forward. The last thing I'd say about the disease, which is fascinating, and Laquila brought this up it, with her doctor that said, I've never quite seen a case like this, mm -hmm. is every time I think I've seen every way thyroid eye disease can present, a patient shows up in my office and, and I, I haven't seen it present that way. It is a very heterogeneous disease that can present innumerable ways. Uh, and so you, you really wanna get to those specialists who've seen it because um, it, it's, it's quite a unique uh, disease. Laquilla, tell us what is a day in the life of living with Graves' disease and Ted disease? Well, well now it's beautiful, but back then, it was it was dark and gloomy, and it what I consider life being sunny and bright when I was first diagnosed, it got dark and gloomy in a New York minute in just a matter of seconds because I had to learn to live with no vision for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Life as I knew it had changed, um, and all I can think of in my mind is twelve six three and nine, I had to reposition my life, my home and everything in that order. And I had, a, I had to depend on home health aides to come in and teach me how to live without vision. And so and if it wasn't if for, vision, yeah. if it wasn't for those doctors at Kel, um, Kellogg Eye Center with the, the many orbital decompressions, the blethoprasty, mm -hmm. all the strabismus surgeries, they were centimeters from my brain. But not being blind was not an option for me. And I'm like, Gail, you know, I always say I fight with faith. Mm -hmm. And when they told me I wasn't going to see again, I was like, that is not an option. I will see again. And thanks to Kimberly and, and Nancy at the uh, National Graves Disease Foundation, they got me to the proper doctors that I needed to get to in 2009. That's pretty incredible. Do you feel more empowered now that you have both your vision and the knowledge around these? Oh, two absolutely. Reasons? I have truly turned my pain and suffering into power. Definitely. I want to ask all of you a question because part of the reason that we're having this conversation is because this is a rare disease, but also because it disproportionately impacts people in the African-American community. And I just wonder what we're learning about this. If the health disparities and the bias that we know about, that we've heard about, articulated both by Laquilla and by Gail in terms of 
getting a doctor to listen and to believe them when they talk about what's happening with their bodies. Um, Kimberly, what, what have we learned about why this is disproportionately impacting people of color and in, and in particular African-Americans? And what can we do about that? Um, you know, I, I wish I had a, a better answer for you. There is just, there's not a, a ton of, of research in that area and, and we need more. I've seen um, a recent study that had to do with um, thyroidectomy outcomes um, to where um, there, there's a possibility of more um, potential complications um, for uh, patients who are African-American and I believe um, Asian as well. Um, and I, I, you know, hopefully Dr. Lully will weigh, on, weigh in on this, um, but I, I don't think we have a good understanding of it and something, you know, that I think we need to do better um, as a foundation is really understanding how the disease intersects with, um, with identity. Um, that it's not, you know, um, my experience was probably very different from Laquilla's experience in terms of getting um, a, a diagnosis and treatment. And as a foundation, you know, we need to do a, a better job of, of really understanding how that's impacting our community. Dr. Lally, let's talk about this. Why is the incidence rate and the severity higher in, in ethnic groups like African Americans? Why is this happening? Well, one one thing we know is there is a hereditary component to the disease. Um, not always, but oftentimes there can be. And uh, so we do see the disease more commonly in females compared to males and in African-Americans about two to one uh, compared to Caucasian patients. Um, Kimberly's right. There's not a lot of research. In fact, even just preparing um, to talk to you today, I did a PubMed search and uh, there's very little in terms of uh, looking at the this disease by way of ethnicity. There was one study that was interesting that that actually found that socioeconomic status, lower socioeconomic status, was associated with more severe disease, and and that would point towards the um, the disparity in healthcare that we are working uh, vigorously to try to to improve. But that these patients may be struggling to either get the information they need or find themselves to the correct uh, providers to get the care they need, and so they're presenting potentially later with a more severe, progressed form of the disease. But a lot of work still to be done in this arena, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Laquilla, I mean, you are the embodiment of what this means, right? Because we know that your journey was was very far along when you were finally diagnosed. What do you think is the cause or is contributing to this alarming rate of disease in, in African-Americans and other people of color? Well, as Dr. Lilly said, when I started doing my research, I found out that it was hereditary on my father's side of the family. Oh. But I used to have to tell the doctors, it's sad because I was a woman of color. Yeah, I am often heard, but never listened to. No one wanted to hear me. And, and I was going to the, what I call the best specialist in the world, mm -hmm. and they still weren't listening. Because, and the reason I say that is because back in 1998, psoriasis grew over my eyelids and, and I didn't realize I had psoriasis. So when I went to the doctor to, um, to tell him that something was going on, like Gail said, you don't sleep, you're all, you function off of 20 minutes of sleep and you can just work a full eight hour day. You know what he said to me? He said, oh, Miss Harris, those are just your nerves. You have to get your nerves under control. Well, if you had been listening, it wasn't just nerves. But you can bet I went back to every last one of those doctors who told me that I wasn't going to see again. I made an appointment with them just so they could see <laughs> that I now have vision. <laughs> I made that my goal. <laughs> That's a that's pretty amazing. And it's also accountability, right? What you yes. said couldn't be done, could be done if, exactly. if only you had listened. We don't have a lot of time left, but I know all of you spend a good amount of time advocating for others so this doesn't happen to them. And so if we could just do rapid fire and Laquilla, you you articulated it so beautifully. Just, you know, the last couple of things you want people to know around advocacy and this rare disease. 
I always say advocate, always journal your feelings daily and weekly. You do these things because you have, oh boy, you have a better understanding of what your rare disease is. And with that better understanding comes the victory. And victory comes in opportunities through better doctors where he or she is listening to you. And if they can't help you, they will refer you to someone who can. C, count on you. Because you may not understand what you're currently going through, nor do you have time to explain to anyone what you're going through because it slows down the process and the progress. Advocate. I say once you master step one through five, you can advocate for yourself and you can advocate for people who live alone. Uh, step seven is team. Build your team of supporters, caregivers, and because you have a better understanding of what your rare disease is, now you can tell your team what your needs are and you can help them better help you. And with all that, comes experience. You have knowledge and understanding of what Graves and thyroid eye disease has cost you emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And with that, you can empower. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me come to you, Kimberly, next. Can you add to those pearls of wisdom there? <laughs> so, no, that was, that was fabulous. I would say just rapid fire, um, eye drops, eye drops, eye drops, use the lubricating kind, not the get the red out because those will be irritating. Um, as Dr. Lelly said, don't smoke, avoid secondhand smoke. And finally, treatment for thyroid eye disease. Remember that this is reconstructive. This is not cosmetic. Mm -hmm. It's not you being vain and wanting to look 20 years younger because it's your high school reunion um, coming up. This is you wanting to get your original appearance back before this disease stole it from you. So um, if your insurance company hassles you about that, um, a doctor um, like Dr. Lully can help intervene. Um, but these treatments are, are restorative, um, reconstructive. They're not cosmetic. Thank you so much. And Dr. Lelly, I'll give you the final word. Well, thank you. Those are those are fabulous uh, pearls. The, the last thing I would add to that is simply get in early with the specialist. Um, and you can find those again, that's focusonted.com. Um, get in early because the sooner we can see you, the sooner we can get a baseline, the sooner we can help you along the pathway and, and help you build your, your team of experts. Um, and, and that's what I would I would end with. That's fantastic. We always have to end with some hope to help people on the journey. Yes. So thank you again, Dr. Lelly, to Kimberly Doris, to Laquilla Harris for your candor, for your courage, for your advocacy on behalf of others, for paying your life forward. That's what this is all about because we are all interconnected. And to our other dynamic speakers, of course, the great Gail Devers, who shared her time and talent and her pearls of wisdom with us, and also Kenita Sealing with the Black Women's Health Imperative. We appreciate the stories, the research, the insight, the leadership in addressing thyroid eye disease and Graves disease. A special thank you to the Graves and Thyroid Eye Disease Foundation for your collaboration and of course for our sponsor, Horizon. And on behalf of the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition, I encourage all of you to learn more about what you can do for your health and the rare disease community at rarediseasediversity.org. That's rarediseasediversity.org. Thank you for sharing this afternoon with us. We wish you good health. We wish you advocacy, and we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. <music>